Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show. The first migrants, Black homesteaders, stake their claim. Earlier this year, Dr. Jacob Freefeld joined us to discuss the Homestead Act of 1862 as part of Abraham Lincoln's legacy. He now returns to discuss the largely unknown story of Black Americans who migrated from the South to the Great Plains after the Civil War to claim land through the Homestead Act. Some created Black homesteader communities while others homesteaded alone. Dr. Jacob Freefeld is the director of the Center of Lincoln Studies at the University of Illinois at Springfield. His first book, Homesteading the Plains Toward a New History, challenges the scholarly consensus about the Homestead Act of 1862. His new book, The First Migrants, How Black Homesteaders' Quest for Land and Freedom Heralded America's Great Migration, tells the epic story of Black Americans homesteading in the Great Plains after the Civil War. For more information about Looking for Lincoln Conversations, visit the Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. It is my pleasure to introduce Jake Freefield. Hi, thanks, Heather, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as Heather said, the last time I was here, I talked a bit about the Homestead Act of 1862, Lincoln's legacy in the West of creating a free land policy. Today, I'm going to wed that uh, legacy with the legacy of emancipation and Black Americans moving West after the Civil War to claim land through the Homestead Act of 1862. But the story I'm going to tell today um, is going to begin at the same place I began the last time I was on. Um, it's going to begin in September 1877 when 308 Black Americans left the verdant hills around Lexington, Kentucky on a perilous journey they hoped would bring them to their promised land. They were led by Reverend Simon Roundtree, a formerly enslaved man, and a white developer named W.R. Hill. Their Canaan was called Kansas. The group gathered in the station near nightfall, men, women, and children carrying their household goods and leading a few cows and horses they crowded together, jostling each other as they boarded the train. Agents from competing railroads badgered them to buy tickets on and travel their lines. The travelers grew tired with crying babies. They sat waiting for hours. Finally, around midnight, the short line train started moving, departing Lexington for Louisville. More migrants joined the train when it stopped in Midway, Kentucky. They shivered and tried to sleep in the noisy, unheated cars. At Louisville, they climbed down, unloaded all their worldly possessions, and changed the Louisville and Indianapolis line. On they went, changing trains several more times, unloading and loading their goods, unloading and loading their livestock, until finally they reached Ellis, Kansas. Done with their train travel, they still had miles to go. Now, why were these folks traveling from Kentucky to Kansas? Um, like other Black Southerners, they'd celebrated the new world that opened for them after 1865. Um, in 1862, Lincoln had passed the Homestead Act. Yes, but there's also another revolution going on, right? He announces the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, signs it in 1863. And these folks, their hopes had soared with the great emancipation and the promise of reconstruction after the war. It was a time of jubilee. But by the mid-1870s, those promises had turned to ash producing anguish and horror. One of the bitterest memories of this post-war year um, was the destruction of freed people's hopes to own land. Uh, Congress had created the Freedmen's Bureau to assist Black Southerners to construct um, their lives as free people. And the Freedmen's Bureau focused on the roughly 1 million acres um, of plantation land confiscated from former Confederate officers. Perfect, right? Take the land from the traders and give it the newly freed people. But in 1866, Andrew Johnson had pardoned most of these Confederates for their treason and returned most of the land to them. So this left little land for the Freedmen's Bureau to settle Black people on, um, and former slave owners retained the most fertile Southern lands. Also in 1866, Congress passed the Southern Homestead Act. This opened 46 million acres of public land in Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi and Arkansas, southern states where the federal government owned land. Um, and this opened it for free land claims. 
And this was meant for freed people to claim land. But the Southern Homestead Act also failed. Um, why? Well, freed people were usually poor, and those public land in those southern states, was, a lot of it was timbered, it needed to be cleared, you needed to, to have money to get the tools to clear the land. And also white Southerners regularly harassed, threatened and intimidated um, black folks who tried to homestead in the South. So without those plantation lands being redistributed and without the Southern Homestead Act, I mean, it was useful for some black folks, but it, it really, broadly wasn't a success. Um, without these two avenues, um, avenues to becoming landowners in the South just weren't open. So Black folks were pulled west. Um, when I talk about the west today, I'm going to be talking about the uh, Great Plains, not the Canadian part, um, but this area. Not, I'm not talking about like Oregon, Washington West. I'm talking about um, the Great Plains, Dakotas, Nebraska, New Mexico, Kansas. Um, so, and some of these folks went west. They were looking for freedom and the opportunity to own land. And W.R. Hill, the white town developer who had accompanied Reverend Roundtree to Kentucky to recruit settlers, assured these settlers that black Kansans lived as equals to whites in western Kansas. And the word was out that the government would give them free land through the Homestead Act of 1862. And just a little bit of review from last time. Um, the Homestead Act of 1862 um, was part of the Republican Party's platform in the 1850s and 60s. Uh, the Republican Party emerged in the 1850s, attracting followers mostly to in opposition to slavery extension into the territories. Their alternative plan was to settle folks on um, free land in the West free lands they, they could build farms on. So the idea was they could go west and claim 160 acres, make improvements on the land, and the land would be theirs free and clear. And when Abraham Lincoln won the presidency in 1860, this major plank in the Republican platform was the Homestead Act. Um, and it was passed pretty easily when the Republicans wasted no time. They passed it by um, May of 1862. And the Homestead Act allowed Anyone who is a head of a family, 21 years old, a U.S. citizen, or declared their intent to become a U.S. citizen, it promised them 160 acres of public land. As long as they built a dwelling on it, cultivated at least 10 acres, and resided on the land for five years. And after that five years, they could prove up, was the term, um, which means they could go into a land office, sh show evidence that they'd been on the land, made improvements, and the land was theirs, all for a small filing fee. So this is really what was driving those Kentuckians, those Black Kentuckians gathered in those train stations, sending them through difficult circumstances towards Kansas. And so they descended from their train at Ellis, the depot nearest their destination. They had trouble finding shelter at first. <laughs> These new arrivals, 308 of them, overwhelmed the small white Kansan town. Um, they had another problem. Hill, the land developer, had assured them that when they bought their train tickets, the cost of freighting their goods and livestock was covered. They now found out different, and they had to drain their savings, paying the bill just to get their goods back from the, the railroad. Worse, Ellis, where they, the train stopped, was still 37 miles from their destination, their promised land at Nicodemus. So they set off across prairie. There weren't any roads. Um, they followed deer trails, buffalo wallows. They guided themselves by compass in the few terrain features they could spot in what had to seem like endless grassland. It was such an alien terrain to them compared to the lush bluegrass and forests of Kentucky. But the thought of their destination, Nicodemus, it buoyed their spirits. The town site company's promotional poster had boasted that Nicodemus was the largest black colony in America. The white developer Hill had told them that Nic the Nicodemus area was teeming with game and wild horses. The horses could easily be caught and tamed to do farm work. The valley had limestone to build their honest homes, 
and abundant firewood for cooking and heating. The valley offered excellent water in the river and its numerous springs. The handbill advertising the town site suggested that the colony would already have erected houses and opened many branches of mercantile business, that a church would have already been constructed, along with other public buildings, including a post office. Once they got settled this, in this marvelous town, they could then go off and claim land through the Homestead Act. Elvira Williams, a migrant, later remembered that we never owned a home of our own. So when we talked of moving into our own house, it was a happy thought. So Nicodemus would be a fine sight when it came into view. As they drew near to their destination, they were confronted with the harsh reality. There was no town of Nicodemus, just a town site and a dream. There were no houses, no church, no buildings whatsoever. There were rolling hills covered by endless grasses that stretched to the horizon. They were particularly distressed to find no trees, which would supply the timber to build houses and provide firewood. Even more troubling, they'd arrived too late to plant crops. Furious at Hill's deceit, they threatened to hang him. Um, they chased him to a friend's dugout, which is a house dug into the side of a hill or down into the ground. Um, <laughs> hill uh, reportedly hid behind his friend's wife under her shawl. They eventually found him and he, Hill fled to another friend's dugout. Um, uh, some distance away, and they had to hide him in a wagon under hay to get him away from the enraged settlers from, who had just traveled from Kentucky based on promises of this already built town to find nothing. He went to Stockton, Kansas, like 20 miles away until cooler heads prevailed and he thought he could come back. Um, so 60 migrants immediately turned around and went back to Lexington, uh, Kentucky. They said no. Um, this is not what we signed up for, we're out. And they went back. But more than 200 stayed. And now, the name Nicodemus um, was probably created by, the, or chosen by the Black founders who had partnered with Hill. And it could have come from a couple places. Um, there was a Pharisee who became a follower of Jesus in the Bible. It's probably not based on that. Um, an oral tradition. Um, there's there's tradition of an African prince who was captured and enslaved and brought to America. And he became the first enslaved person to buy his freedom. That could be it, but it's more likely based on the popular song at the time, Wake Nicodemus. Um, and I, I won't sing because we'll lose all of you from this program if I start to sing. So I'll just read a verse of it um, as if it's a poem. Nicodemus the slave was of African birth and was bought for a bag full of gold. He was reckoned as part of the salt of the earth, but he died years ago, very old. T'was his last sad request, so he laid him away in the trunk of an old hollow tree. Wake me up, was his charge, at the first break of day. Wake me up for the great jubilee. So the song is about this enslaved person who dies and is buried but then wakes up or rises again at the great jubilee when slavery is over. And so when they named the town Nicodemus, or the settlement Nicodemus, they, these folks thought they were about important business. This wasn't just another town. This wasn't like Jonestown, as you might find a random town name. This was Nicodemus. Um, so despite the desolate area, um, they were serious. A lot of these folks were very serious about the settlement. And more settlers followed. Um, as impressive as the name might be, though, the new arrivals were also not impressed. They were as disappointed as our first arrivals. Uh, Williana Hickman was with this second group that arrived in Nicodemus. And she remembers arriving that when she was in the, a wagon, she wasn't feeling well. She was traveling with her husband and another in a group of folks, and she started hearing the men whooping and hollering, there's Nicodemus, there's Nicodemus. And she said she sat up in the wagon, and her words, I looked with all the eyes I had and said, where is Nicodemus? And her husband and the men pointed to 
a bunch of dugouts like the one on the screen, these houses dug into the ground with sod bricks built up around them as well, with chimneys poking out. And they said, there is Nicodemus. And Williana Hickman said she wept. Uh, one group following shortly after had been joined by Abram Hall and E.P. McCabe, uh, two newspapermen from Chicago. So more middle class guys coming not to find out what Nicodemus is all about. They heard some great things. But as they were walking towards Nicodemus behind a wagon, McCabe noticed something odd. He noticed people in the party picking up buffalo chips, so um, manure, dried manure, tossing it into the wagon. So, well, to each his own. He wasn't quite sure what they were up to until they stopped for the night. And he realized what the buffalo chips were for. They were a result of there being no trees around in Kansas. Um, without trees, you didn't have firewood. And so you cooked your food over the buffalo or the buffalo chips and the cow chips. McKay was he said he didn't eat that first night when he saw it happen, but he apparently later on became a, a pretty good uh, cow chip chef himself. Um, so most migrants stayed despite you know cooking with the, the cow chips and the forbidding terrain. They wanted to build a community beyond the close scrutiny of white authority um, in the South. And it was free from the pervasive violence that accompanied it. Uh, they believed in their bones that owning land was the surest path to this larger goal. But could they succeed in such a harsh and unwelcoming place? Most who stayed filed homesteads. Um, W.R. Hill wanted to sell lots in town lots in Nicodemus, but Nicodemus just became a larger community and neighborhood. There was a town for a while, um, but most of the action was in the hinterland with folks filing on these 160 acre homestead claims. And there's hardship early on. They had lack of farming equipment, there were prairie fires, drought, grasshopper infestation. That might sound quaint, but um, grasshopper infestation, you'd see them coming as like a wall of grasshoppers. Um, frequent crop failure challenged the community. Um, the town founders had failed to consider the limited funds the colonists would bring with them when they came to Nicodemus. And some of the settlers had wagons and plows and owned teams. But those first settlers arrived too late for the growing season to plant, which set them back early on. They had to exhaust their cash reserves almost immediately. Some relied on employment with the railroads or in towns east of Nicodemus. They relied on charity as well. They received help in the early years from white settlers traveling west who owned lock, uh, oxen, horses, plows, um, and other equipment. Local farmers contributed food to them. Uh, Osage Indians returning from their annual hunt contributed food as well. The town set up a formal organization to distribute food and other goods uh, from charitable sources in these first couple of years. They petitioned the governor for a relief, but he refused. Um, they also set up a more organized campaign to raise charity, um, sending solicitors to far off places as far as the Michigan State Fair. But dependence on charity for these folks seemed to run contrary to their dream of a self-supporting Black community. Um, and then they, they had another issue. Um, in 1879, more folks started arriving around Nicodemus. And these folks were more refugees from the South, fleeing the end of Reconstruction and the unremitting violence um, that accompanied it. And so Nicodemus was concerned with this new influx of folks. They continued to rely on char charity. Um, it might collapse the town. So and this was contentious within the community. They um, debated on their responsibility to help these new refugees arriving. But in April 1879, Nicodemus settlers held a meeting to consider the issue and decided to cease their efforts to recruit um, charitable donations. They're going to have to rely on their farms to provide for them. And slowly, they began to amass wealth. And you see in this photo, pardon me, looking off to the side, I have multiple screens, screens running here. Um, you see in this photo, um, this is a Nicodemus family, the Mitchell family. Um, they're dressed, this is likely a pose photo, so they, they have their nice clothes on. Um, but you can see they are amassing some wealth. They have a wooden house, first of all. So it's not built of, of sod bricks. So they have 
gain some wealth to buy the wood to build the house. You can see livestock photobombing in the background. Um, they've got some wealth. Um, and and Nicodemus families, like the Mitchells, start accruing livestock, uh, farm machinery, fencing, storage bins, um, and other equipment needed to make successful farms. Uh, many dug and drew water from wells to irrigate their vegetable crops uh, and fruit trees. They raised chickens and milked cows, sold eggs, milk, cream, and butter in town, like many other homesteaders, white and black. They become prosperous, and many in the spans of their lives had gone from being owned to owning land. By the mid-1880s, it was a moderately prosperous settlement, um, enjoying the highs when harvests were good, but suffering the lows when hit by drought, hail, and prairie fire, and those grasshoppers I mentioned. The population of the community eventually stabilized around 300. And again, that's not a dense 300. That's 300, some in town, but most living in that hinterland. And the town itself peaked in the 1880s. So here's an image of Nicodemus from that period. Um, this is a, you can see white and black folks here. This is a 4th of July celebration, which was one of the largest celebrations in Nicodemus. Um, they... Um, celebrate the 4th of July every year. And they also celebrated Emancipation Day um, at the end of July and aug around August 1st. They still celebrate to this day. Nicodemus is still there as a national historic site. They still celebrate um, Emancipation Day and call it homecoming as well. And so descendants come back and visit Nicodemus and they have a parade and um, really good food. Um, so you sh should definitely go check it out, uh, Emancipation Day next year. Um, the town peaked in 1880, and, and the town itself starts to decline when they don't get, like most, like most other towns around this era, decline. When they don't get the railroad, um, the railroad decided to build its own town of Bogue, Kansas, rather than go through any of the existing towns. And they also didn't get the county seat. And so Nicodemus, the, the town remains, but again, the actions in the hinterland, and it, the town remains for a place where the school is at um, and the church. Um, in, in other buildings. By 1899, Nicodemus residents um, had gained 88 homestead patents, making them owners of over 13,000 acres of land. Um, other Black homesteader settlements followed Nicodemus in the following decades. Um, we had Blackton, New Mexico. Now they're all on this map. We have Blackton, New Mexico, Deerfield, Colorado. Empire, Wyoming, DeWitty, Nebraska. Um, these places had a lot in common. Uh, first of all, let's think about the names. Um, we, once again, I already mentioned Nicodemus. It's that name. It's an important name. They know they're about important business. Blackdom, New Mexico. Like it's a kingdom of black people. Deerfield, Colorado. Named because the land is so dear to them. Right, this theme of from own to land owned. Empire, Wyoming. DeWitty, Nebraska doesn't seem that grand, right? Until you realize that later the folks living there changed its name to Audacious, Nebraska. These folks knew these places were important. They were important to them um, symbolically and um, to raise their families. And they had more in common. Um, education. The first thing that happened in any of these Black homesteader sites was folks built a school. Uh, Jenny and Zachary Fletcher, Nicodemus uh, settlers, immediately um, began a school in their dugout. Jenny was the teacher. And I mean, this might not say much because, right, a lot of settlements, the first thing they do is open a school. But if you're folks without a lot of cash who need to do farm work, it's a statement that you're going to expend some of your labor in teaching rather than, rather than that work. Um, especially depending on the age of the students, right? Um, you're taking the, the young child out of the um, workforce, and you're also taking the teacher out of the workforce. Um, it was important. Um, and, and this is the Nicodemus school they built after the dugout, which still stands there today. It's built in the 1880s. Um, in Empire, Wyoming, uh, Russell Taylor, who had a degree in divinity, taught at the Empire School, which 
almost certainly made him the most well-educated person in the county at the time, teaching at the Empire School. Um, and schooling was important too, because it was forbidden in slavery. Uh, there was a Nicodemus settler who carried a brand on his cheek that he got when his owner had caught him uh, learning to read. Um, Nicodemus, the schooling was important. And he, the, the gentleman with the brand arrived in Nicodemus' books in his hand, um, ready to, to help in the cause of teaching. Movement is another uh, theme here. Again, you couldn't move when you were enslaved. And they left the South. They said, no, we're, we're going to own our own land. Um, even if it's not available to us here, we're going to go to the Great Plains. And these were places, these were staging grounds for the next generation. Um, when I talk to descendants of Black homesteaders, they often say, well, the, the place itself, yeah, it doesn't exist anymore, but it wasn't meant to last. They were there for us to, to own land in that first generation, but to then to educate the children so they could go off and do whatever they wanted. Oftentimes, that meant moving to cities. Um, black homesteaders, how many of them were there? Um, there were about 3,500. This is These are estimates um, based on, on math. I can send you an article where you can read all of the math that we did, but um, I don't know if you want to do that. Uh, Including family members, that's about 25,000 people, uh, Black Americans moving west to Homestead to the, just the Great Plains, with about 650,000 acres of land claimed, about the size of Rhode Island. Um, at, at these settlements, they're doing the, the work of the basic work of democracy, right? They're building communities, building schools, um, churches, governing themselves, building a safe place where they can raise the next generation um, and make a living. Um, and at this, during this period, you might be thinking, safe place. Um, is, is the West really a safe place for Black Americans during this period, from about 1870s through the 1930s? Um, there's breathtaking violence in Omaha, Nebraska, and Tulsa, in North Platte, Nebraska. Um, Baseman Taylor, a Black homesteader um, at Empire, was murdered while in the custody of um, county law enforcement. Is this a safe place? Um, the Baseman Taylor um, murder is really the um, only example of lethal violence we found in our research. <clears throat> Nicodemus and DeWitty, uh, the, there was hostility, um, but it was different than the hostility that was found in the South. Um, the Great Plains as a region, yes, was racist during this period. Um, this is, there's a larger racial environment that oppressed Black Americans in the Great Plains. When Nicodemus homesteaders traveled to nearby Stockton to buy supplies, um, they were required to get out of town by sundown. It was a sundown town. When Lena Spies of DeWitty and her siblings attended the Brownlee Church in the nearest town, um, the white parishioners made certain they felt unwelcome. When Rose Spies, also of DeWitty, took her children to enroll in Seneca schools, they were told the schools were full. Were they? Probably not. One might expect breathtaking amount, amounts of violence as well in this period, um, not just because of, of the racial aspect, but because it's a period when white ranchers were often in open warfare with white homesteaders. Um, Ranchers were not excited when the Homestead Act was passed, when homesteaders started fencing land, that's land that used to be pasture land for ranchers, battles often ensued. Uh, we only found one uh, confrontation like this, and it was at DeWitty, a town that was later renamed Audacious. Um, William P. Walker, one of the settlers, fenced his land, um, and a rancher approached him about it and said, well, that part of my ranch is in that land you just fenced. And they worked out a deal where the white rancher would pay the black homesteader um, in hay for the use of that land. And they found um, common ground. Uh, there were similar incidents in Nicodemus. Several times, cowboys intentionally ran their herds over black farmers' fields, destroying their crops. In 1878, a Nicodemus resident complained in a letter to the governor that cowboys had made six raids that summer. Uh, one time, some cowboys got irritated. 
that Nicodemus people were watering their cows in the South Solomon River. So they drove off the Nicodemus cows. But unlike um, in the South, the Nicodemus men thought they could get justice here. So the Nicodemus folks managed to capture one of the cowboys and they held him hostage until the cowboys returned their cows. And after the black folks joined by some nearby white homesteaders defended themselves a few times, the cowboys pretty much left them alone. Four years after those incidents, Nicodemus settler E.P. McCabe, remember the guy who didn't like the, the cow chip cooking, he was elected to statewide public office as auditor in a period when black voting rights were under constant attack in the South. So for the most part, um, black homesteaders agreed that they were better off in the Great Plains. Lulu Craig was a child when her parents homesteaded in Nicodemus. Later in life, she was asked if homesteaders were better off in Kansas than they had been in the South. Without hesitation, she said yes. Um, original Nicodemus homesteader Thomas Johnson stated that, quote, by coming to Kansas from Kentucky, I had decidedly bettered my condition in life. Anderson Bowles, another Nicodemus homesteader, declared that he would, quote, never return to old Kentucky. Most others agreed. Not all homesteaders in this uh, book settled in large communities. Um, Oscar Michaud is someone who settled alone. Um, his story ends with the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, but it begins uh, much simpler. He moved from Metropolis, Illinois. He was born to formerly enslaved parents who were farmers. He wanted to get out of town as quickly as possible. He didn't think farming was the life for him. And so he went to Chicago, much larger than Metropolis, um, around 1907. He becomes a Pullman porter. He's paid well. He's tipped well. He knocked downs. He makes extra money from that. Um, really, that's uh, from conductors underreporting the number of tickets they sell and then paying the Pullman porters to keep quiet and go along with the scam. So he's making good money. He seem, seemingly has made it as a Pullman porter in Chicago after leaving Metropolis. But he sees scenery like this. And this is from a photo I took near where Empire. Wyoming used to exist. He sees scenes like this. And he says, as he remembers seeing these scenes on the train, that during the summer, the Midwest and the Great Plains, it's one large garden farm dotted with numerous cities, thriving hamlets and towns, fine country homes, so characteristic of the Great Middle West and is always appealing to the eye. You can't find a better metaphor than a Pullman porter pushing a plow. He must have gone through the agonies of hell. Well, spoilers, pull, um, uh, Michaud goes back to farming and he claims a homestead in South Dakota. And one of his neighbors recalls this about him later, trying to transition from being a Pullman porter to homesteading in South Dakota. Now, Michaud, he made his homestead last for a while. Um, but he starts to write to newspapers while he's in South Dakota as well. He starts becoming this intellectual booster of homesteading for black Americans. He says, is it enough to make one feel disgusted to see and read thousands of poor white people going west every day and in 10 or 15 years time becoming prosperous and happy as well as making the west the greatest and happiest place on earth? Jews, Germans, Swedes, Arabs, and Southern whites and Irish were all on hand to get land. He's arguing in newspapers that Black Americans ought to go west as well. Michaud eventually continues to write these, these newspaper articles, but then gets really into writing. He eventually leaves his homestead to make a, a full go of his writing and writes about his homesteading experience in The Conquest. Look at the... the um, author line by a Negro pioneer. He turns the conquest into a, a movie called The Homesteader, and he becomes one of the early great Black American filmmakers, making movies into the 1940s. As he's making films, a lot of his films contain elements from his homesteading days. Um, at one point when he's homesteading, he starts having feelings for a white woman, and again realizes that can't, that's not possible in 
this world he lives in. Though safer than the South, the Great Plains still won't allow some things. And that makes its way into a lot of his movies. In the movies, um, the white woman ends up having a secret black mother, and so the two characters can be together at the end. But he plays with race in his movies. Um, he responds to D.W. Griffith's extremely racist film, um, uh, Birth of a Nation. I almost forgot the name. Uh, in the Birth of a Nation, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but like, there's a lynching that's played heroically. Uh, the KKK is the hero of the film. Michelle responds to this, though, on uh, making his own film that shows the real horrific violence of the South. And there's, there's Michelle on set. And he's clapping back at D.W. Griffith. Um, Michelle makes use of a quote from D.W. Griffith's next film, After Birth of the Nation. Um, this quote precedes the film. Harm not the stranger within your gates, lest you yourself be hurt. Um, Michelle found this ironic that he'd say, do not harm the stranger within your gates when um, he's played that harm in his previous film, D.W. Griffith has, um, as heroic. And so Michaud entitles his film Clapping Back at Birth of a Nation, showing the horrors of racism in the South. He titles it Within Our Gates, um, using that quote against Griffith. Michaud was born in Metropolis to enslaved parents. He becomes a landowner in the first great Black American filmmaker. Um, maybe not a homesteading story, but part of it. it. It grows from the homesteading story of Oscar Michaud. Um, the stories of Nicodemus and Oscar Michaud aren't the only ones you'll find um, in this book. 200 miles to the northeast of Nicodemus, as Nicodemus was founded, Henry Burden, pictured here with his family, um, was proving up his homestead in Nebraska. He had been born into slavery in Virginia and escaped um, debt in the South after emancipation to come north. Moses Spies, like Henry Burden, comes north to homestead in Nebraska. This is not... Um, Moses Spies. Um, this is his half brother, Jerry Shores, but their his homestead is adjacent to his brother Moses Spies. They homestead near each other, and they end up moving on to several of those um, homesteader communities I mentioned earlier. This book recounts these largely unknown stories: the story of Black people homesteading in the Great Plains. It's a combination of two parts of the Lincoln legacy that free land policy and emancipation. Now, Black Americans took these two parts of the Lincoln legacy and fused them in the Great Plains. It's also the opening movement of the Great Migration that will take Black Americans to cities later in the century. The action was homesteading early on. Knowing their story changes our understanding of our past. It's a history that disrupts and enriches the conventional story of who settled the West and it adds a largely unrecognized dimension to the African-American struggle for equality. But I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk now. Let's, uh, let's have a conversation. Thank you so much, Jake. That was really good. So um, everyone, my name is Heather Fieser. I'm welcome to tonight's show. And it's now time to take your questions. So if you haven't yet, please type them in the chat and we will try to get through as many of them as possible before we get to the end of our time tonight. And I get the pleasure of asking the first question. So Jake, what you mentioned Nicodemus today, so it still exists. So I have kind of like two questions related to that. So are there people in Nicodemus today that ancestors actually settled Nicodemus? That's the first question. The second question is, is like, I know that there's a national park there, but like what is left of the community? Yeah, so there are folks who actually live in the place, the, the, like some houses on, in Nicodemus. I don't think any of those folks are descendants, though I know there are descendants who live around and work at the historic site. And um, actually, the foreword of the book is written by a Nicodemus descendant of the preface of the book, uh, Angela Bates, who was the president of the Nicodemus National Historic uh, or Nicodemus Historical Society for years. I and mean, so there are 
um, descendants involved in uh, taking care of the place. And I also mentioned that the, the plugs of the book are not shameless um, because the um, proceeds go to help the Nicodemus Historical Society, as well as the Great Plains Black History Museum in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, but yes, Nicodemus is still there. You should visit. They have great interpreters. And yeah, some of those folks are descendants. I think they're descendants of Nicodemus who live here in Springfield, I want to say. I've actually never. never Interesting. Yeah. All right. So um, here is our next question. Um, okay, so when they when they came when they when they first settled because I mean mostly what you, you started your most of your talk was on Nicodemus, and they got there and they couldn't and they couldn't plant like what were the crops that they were able to grow when they actually had growing seasons because this would have been I mean they were from Kentucky and they were a lot of them were formerly enslaved I'm assuming they were not trying to grow cotton in Kansas right no they weren't and they I mean they had some experience with other crops in Kentucky but there yeah I mean I found and I I mean I haven't um like gone through and created giant spreadsheets of what white homesteaders um, uh, grew and what black homesteaders grew so this is based on just sort of reading the homestead documents which um are great documents, some of which are available uh, via Ancestry, because when they go to prove up, they have to write down often what they've grown. And so we have that information from a lot of those documents. So they're growing a lot of the same stuff their white neighbors are growing. Um, wheat and corn a lot of the times. Um, a lot of times they're planting, trying to plant fruit trees, seeing that those will work out. Um, a lot of them are li living off of uh, vegetables and vegetable gardens um, for a time. And a lot of folks and a lot of white homesteaders did this as well, will leave during the winter to work for the railroad <clears throat> to earn some extra money so they can um, buy seed and perhaps farm equipment as well. Oh, that's interesting. So they may not have stayed there in the in the whole winter. They may have left to go and, and get some employment and then come back. Right. Yeah. And you couldn't be on, be gone too long because residency is one of these requirements. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Didn't they have to prove that they'd been there? For <laughs> and so like you'd see in, in some of the homestead documents, they'll write was gone between these months. And you have to have two witnesses to vouch for you as well. Um, and so the witnesses would have to vouch for you. And that and I, like I, I would like to talk about that a little bit where that, that moment when you're a black homesteader, especially going into the land office and you have to rely, especially these folks who are homesteading alone, like Henry Burden, you have to rely on your white neighbors to witness for you. And that's a leap of faith because it's a very precarious time. Like if you, if you go in after five years and you don't get your land, that five years is for nothing. You've lost um, a real investment. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Okay. So here's our next question. Did you come across any failed homesteading stories? Um, so, not real. I mean, you could, I guess you could consider Michelle, Michelle proves up his homestead, but he doesn't like, he ends up losing it in his mortgage because he's, uh, he ends up moving family up there too. And is trying to work too many farms at once. <laughs> Michelle's a little bit too ambitious. And then he gets really into his writing and filmmaking and that it's the end of it. Um, the, the interesting thing is uh, I think failed homesteads in general as a topic, white and black is um, a great topic for some graduate student out there. Um, <laughs> To tackle because the the successful homestead records and the failed homestead records, I think, are in different um, national archives. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> really? They're, they're so not think, together. No, the, the successful ones are at College Park in Maryland. The failed ones, I believe, are in Kansas City. So, yes. So, so yeah, I don't have a good sense. So, I mean, there could be, I mean, there, there could be evidence of like a lot of black homesteaders trying to settle alone that didn't get their land, but I, I mean, we wouldn't know from the homestead records alone. Um, yeah, wow. that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there's a whole dissertation to be written about contested homesteads too, because you have to publish that you in, intend to prove up. And so it lets the public know. So they, someone thinks you're up to something, they can contest your homestead claim. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I do want to ask you a little bit more about Nicodemus. So we you you mentioned in the you mentioned a couple things that stood out to me. When they first get there, there's nothing there, right? There's no like nothing that they thought was going to be there. There wasn't a school, there wasn't really stores. There was like just grass waving in the breeze, right? Okay. So that's that's the first point. But 
Then later you talk about how there's a school. So I'm assuming at some point there were stores and there was like a general store and people could come there and purchase. Like it became an actual, even though not a huge town, it actually became a functioning community. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, that, that oh. picture I showed of the 4th of July, like, yeah, there, there's a general, I think the general store might be in that photo. Um, but yeah, they, they actually build by the late 1880s, they build a pretty good town with white and black folks living there. Um, and they think for a while they might get the county seat. Um, and so there, there's speculation that maybe Nicodemus is going to be like the this boom town. Maybe they'll be able to really make a go of it. But then when, when again, the railroad doesn't go through and they think they're going to get the railroad for a little while too, until the railroad built, tries to make money building their own town, which also doesn't grow much. Like the town of Bogue is still there, but it's a small town. Um, so ahead. do you think that was more because they wanted to make money or also because this was a significant African-American community? I guess that's a debate. And I think some folks, I think argue, um, some descendants argue that it was um, about a little bit about race, at least. Um, they didn't, I mean, notably, the, the railroad didn't go through one of the neighboring white towns and they planted its own town. Um, it's difficult, difficult to tell. I mean, the, the person, the guy who surveyed Nicodemus, too, ends up um, getting murdered. And yeah. there's there's debate there about whether he's murdered because he surveyed this town for um, black homesteaders. But he's also been essentially in like open warfare with his like surrounding neighbors like he's a prominent political operative in the area and there's he's been involved in gunfire incidents with neighbors before he's ever surveys for Nicodemus so he's living a violent life anyway um yeah okay so we're after so were the people and I know eventually you said that one of the the people from the community goes off and is a representative for that a community in mm -hmm. um in like the state legislature i believe he's um elected auditor yeah, of the state of the state okay so did all like the african-american citizens uh, get to vote in yeah. nicodemus yes okay they did they got to vote um and that's why they thought they thought maybe because it, which i mean it's incredible that E.P. McCabe wins a statewide election in Kansas. But yes, um, and so in these sort of um, battles to become the county seat, the town of Roscoe thinks that maybe if it can curry the, the Nicodemus votes, because it's the next town over from Nicodemus, it can become um, the county seat. Um, but there was, there was an issue like right around the election. It was a couple of years before the election. There's this issue where they get done building like a, a mill in Roscoe. There are um, Nicodemus folks who helped build it. They they go home and they're having a party at the mill in Roscoe. And it's just white folks there. And the Nicodemus workers who helped build it show up and want to party as well. And they just shut the party down. And then once the Nicodemus guys go away, they start it up again. And the Nicodemus guys come back and start pelting it with rocks. Gunfire is exchanged. And this, this incident... I, could possibly have cost Roscoe the county seat because it loses the Nicodemus vote, and it probably ends up costing both communities. Um, but yeah, they um, they voted. And E.P. McCabe, he serves a term as as auditor. When, once the town of Nicodemus sort of dies down, they don't get the county seat or railroad. He moves to Oklahoma, and he tries to organize Oklahoma as an all black state. Um, and he then goes on when when that doesn't happen, he goes on to um, found a, an all black town in Oklahoma. As well, so E.P. McCabe has a, a pretty um, impressive history after Nicodemus as well. Okay, so here's our next question: How did and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but maybe you can expand on it some more. So, how did whites and neighboring communities respond to the blacks and Nicodemus? So it, it depends on the community we're talking about. So Nicodemus. I mean, th there are these issues with cowboys early on. How much of that is driven by race? I mean, again, cowboys, um, ranchers, and homesteaders are in open war anyway and don't get along. You ever seen Oklahoma? I was I was thinking the the song from Oklahoma was playing in the mind about the rancher, <laughs> the ranchers and the farmers, and they don't get along. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. Um, I so, think that's a Western theme, actually, of the West. There's the the people who want to, to the go, and the people who put up fences, and they don't like the people who put up fences. 
so yeah, Nicodemus folks um, and his descendants believe they have pretty good um, relationships with, with the surrounding community. I mean, again, incredible that he became elected to statewide office. Dewitty as well. Um, some of those towns, when you they go miles away, it, it's more troubling. They can't get um, accommodations. Um, but the ranchers that are around them, they get along with. They often work on their ranch um, for extra money as well. Um, but when you get to Empire, Wyoming, Empire collapses because of racism. And it's a smaller number of homesteaders there. There are only about 10 homesteaders. <clears throat> the community only gets to be about like 60 to 80 people. But Baseman Taylor, one of the homesteaders, um, his family actually calls the police to try to get him um, committed because he's um, threatening self-harm. Uh, he's not well. And while he's in the custody of the police, he, he dies and is, is murdered by the police. And um, Russell Taylor, the really educated um, divinity um, scholar who ends up teaching at the Empire School, he ends up becoming obsessed with trying to get justice for his brother, uh, Baseman Taylor. And he never does. And the, the case goes nowhere. Um, and the, the community then... Sort of, Without Russell Taylor's constant leadership, it sort of falls apart in the end. Um, in Blackdom, uh, New Mexico, um, by all accounts, early on, things were going well with the surrounding white community. Um, and it, at first, it was a lot of Northerners who had moved around Roswell in, in Blackdom, and Roswell's the nearest bigger town. Um, there were no aliens. Um, but uh, eventually, Southerners then move in, and then things get progressively worse. Um, and, and Blackton becomes a sort of refuge community outside of, of Roswell, where they, a lot of the folks sort of had, had gone back and forth between uh, Blackton and Roswell. Um, the, in Deerfield, Colorado is interesting because um, the, there's like a constant connection between the Black community in Denver and Deerfield, Colorado. It's in Gre near Greeley, Colorado, so it's not that far away from Denver. And so you have people I'm sort of making money still working in Denver and then coming to, to Deerfield um, as well to try to farm. Um, and so like, the, the surrounding white community there, it, it, there I thought I, I don't recall a large one around Deerfield. In fact, like the, there's competing a black community of folks from, from Denver who founded another community nearby called Chapelton, which it's very difficult to tell the difference between the Deerfield and Chapelton homesteads. Like it's, for our, for our purposes, it's a lo one larger community, but there's sort of a rivalry there as well. Um, so overall, we found that like the reaction wasn't, um, it was definitely not as violent as they would have expected or a lot of black homesteaders in the South um, confronted when they were trying to, to claim land. All right, here's our next question. What was the base of Nicodemus's economy and where were its markets? Mm -hmm. So... It's markets, so you end up getting, after like it becomes clear that there are no, <coughs> that Nicodemus isn't going to become the county seat. So for a while, they have businesses there, um, but Stockton, Kansas, um, it's reliant, it's going off to Stockton, I think is the next largest town. Hill City becomes the county seat. So there's another town that becomes the county seat first, but it's like it's wiped out by pra either Prairie Fire or Tornado, I, I forget which, but then Hill City, founded by W.R. Hill becomes the um, uh, the county seat. But yeah, so the markets are in the surrounding town, Stockton, Hill City, and the economic base ends up being the land and the, the crops they're growing. Um, and again, a lot of these black homesteader communities that are really relying on the land. So like World War I, things are pretty good, right? The, the price of food is up, they're um, uh, selling crops. But by the time the Dust Bowl hits, um, the, a lot of these communities um, empty out and there aren't that many folks left. Now, is that a failure? Um, like I said, a lot of the descendants say, well, they weren't meant to last anyway. They're meant to be there to, to give us a safe place to educate the next generation. And then they could go on wherever. It just so happens the opportunities were in the cities after the 1930s. That yeah, answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, I think you yeah, I think you answered I think you answered the question. I, I was curious too when you were talking about Nicodemus and and the town that they got off the train in and you said I think it was like 30 miles away. 
Were there any other communities closer or like that first year when they got there and there was literally nothing? Did they have to go back to that town to get provisions and stuff? Like how did they prepare for the winter? Right. Yeah, that's difficult. So when, once you're there, you, ha you have some folks with tools. So you're building essentially dugouts. So you're like stripping sod, building sod bricks and building your walls out of that, which is a whole sort of different sort of thing than anyone's used to because there are bugs living in your walls, snakes falling from your ceiling. Yeah. And then I... <laughs> oftentimes dug into the side of a hill. Um, you're just building that shelter as quickly as possible. Um, the, those first settlers at Nicodemus, they were recruited because they were, um, compared to most other freedmen, more wealthier. So they had some cash reserves. Of course, they had to drain those, getting their goods back from the, the railroad. Um, when they realized their um, uh, freight wasn't paid for. But then they spent a lot of the rest of those reserves sort of, yeah, going back to town and keeping themselves provisioned for the the winter. And, and again, that charity they received from passing uh, settlers staking their own homesteads. Yeah. Well, it was just, it's just so challenging, you know, just to even think about having the willpower to do all of those things. <laughs> We have, it so, we have it so easy now. Like, especially especially in, like Nicodemus, when you get there and you realize it's based on like based on a lie, like that it's like well, those first settlers and there's nothing there. And Liliana Hickman just weeping. Um, then that's not the only one. Like, so when Deerfield first gets started, um, O.T. Jackson, the founder of Deerfield, I think he like prints at one point that, oh, yes, if you come out to Deerfield, you'll arrive in Denver and then a ferry boat will take you to Deerfield. There's no, there's no well, body of water. Let, let's Denver. face it. I mean, you had this same story of, of, you know, immigrants arriving from a foreign country and getting to where they were supposed to be. And, it, you know, it, I, I don't think those bill things that they sell people on were exactly vetted by anyone back then. So. Well, in, in, the, in the Homestead Act is interesting, too, because it's, it is a really pro-immigration uh, law. It's meant to lure, lure immigrants over um, because like it, at that point you had to spend five years in the United States um, to become a citizen. And to homestead, you had to declare your intent as an immigrant to become a citizen and then prove up in five years. So it perfectly matches that time it would take you to become a citizen, uh, which is convenient. Um, and along that line, um, were there, okay, so we know that there were other all like white communities. Were there any other type of immigrant communities around Nicodemus or something like, I, cause I know like in different ways, there were different groups of immigrants that came over to homestead as well from different countries. Yeah. I'm not sure if there were any, I don't think there were any, I mean, this is probably not true. I mean, there were probably clusters of different immigrants around Nicodemus, but um, Henry Burden though, that uh, black homesteader who homesteaded alone he learns to speak some Czech because he's around so many Central European and Czech immigrants when he settles in Nebraska. Um, so yeah, they're, 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 this is a real um, intermixing that's going on. Uh, Michaud is definitely coming into contact with um, Swedes and Norwegians at that point up in um, South Dakota. Um, but yeah, it, I think Burden is the best example of sort of the, the sort of cosmopolitan um, which we don't think of the great, the great plains, right? It's a, it's a very cosmopolitan place, but yes, at this time, you know, you have, um, uh, all, all sorts of immigrant communities growing up out there. A lot of, a lot of central Europe, um, if we're talking uh, Kansas, Nebraska and the Dakotas you know, and Scandinavia. Yeah. So I was just curious if there would have been other communities. So thank you for that. Absolutely. All right. So we are just about out of time. So I'm going to end with our final question, which has really nothing to do with homesteading whatsoever. But we do want to ask, why do you think it's important to still study the legacy of Abraham Lincoln in 2023? Well, I think um, I, I gave an answer last time. So now like, I think I'd said something about the unfinished work, right? I, I went back to, to the Lincoln's words. But I, I just want to sort of plug the, this idea of uh, the Black homesteading experience being part of Lincoln's legacy, right? Um, I think how we consider Lincoln's legacy is always broadening. Um, and I, I just think there are, are a lot of things we don't understand yet about the, the depth and the, the distance of Lincoln's legacy, not just about his life and times, but about folks that are taking 
two of these things that Lincoln might, might have not even realized that there'd be large numbers of black Americans going west to Homestead, taking these two parts of his legacy, free land and emancipation, infusing it together. But now we're studying it. Um, and I think that is important in itself. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us tonight. It has been very interesting. And thank you for taking time to share with us this evening. I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in. And we hope you will join us next month. So without any further ado, everyone have a wonderful evening. And we will see you again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.